Hello. Um, I'm Sal Freudenberg, and I'm going to talk about neurodiversity and software development. Um, and this is just a topic that is so, so dear to my heart. Certainly over the last year or year and a half, I've been talking about neurodiversity at lots of different events. And whilst this has still got kind of the bare bones of, of some of those talks, I've now diversified my talk on diversity, so it's, it's even more kind of far-reaching. Um, and I got interested in talking about neurodiversity when my son was diagnosed with autism, and I looked at some of the behaviours that I was seeing through him and thought, you know what, well, actually, I do quite a lot of those myself. Um, and I went online and did an autistic test, um, and in the test, the average score that people get is about 16. Um, they say that if you've got, um, if you get a score higher than about 32, about 80% of people with a score higher than, higher, than, um, higher than 32 are very likely to have an autistic spectrum disorder, and I came out with a score of 41. So I kind of self-identify as, as probably on the, on the autistic spectrum. Um, but I'm going to start off with uh, talking, um, by putting us in a really nice safe place, and I'm just going to start off by talking about collaboration in general. So about uh, more than 10 years ago, I um, studied collaboration. And I was particularly interested in looking at pair programming. And I thought at the time, do you know what, if I want to know about collaboration, the best way to understand collaboration is to look at what people are talking about. Okay. And so that's what I did. I started looking about particularly pair programmers, what do pair programmers talk about when they're collaborating together? Because it seemed natural that they would talk about anything that was going on for them, and it would be a really good place for look, to look for cute clues um, about how that collaboration took place. And um, so invested was I at the time in this idea about um, the talking, which did tell us some things, but um, that I recorded um, transcribed and analysed 14,866 sentences of pair programmer dialogue. Um, and I didn't think, uh, so that's before I even had my autistic son, and at the time I didn't think there was anything at all strange in doing that. Um, and there were some quite worthy kind of out outcomes from that. Um, I also looked at the uh, general language that people used about verbalization and the research that was out there about verbalization. Um, one of the things I came across quite quickly was the idea that when we talk about stuff, um, actually that can help us problem solve. So there's a great body of work out there by a lady called Michelin Chi on self-explanation, on this idea that when I talk about a problem, sometimes that will be enough to help me get to the solution space. Um, and in fact, uh, Dr. John Sturdy calls that the rubber plant effect, and I'm sure some of you will have heard it being called the rubber duck effect. And it makes a lot of sense, really, that, that when I'm working, particularly in an intangible domain like software development, when I talk and I kind of externalize the problem space somewhat, then I'm looking at it in a different way, and I can see maybe see holes in my logic um, or whatever it is. And I'm sure most of you have sometimes been in a situation where you know, you've got a problem that you're really struggling with, you go and find someone to help you, and while you're explaining the problem to them, the solution just comes to you without them even saying anything. So that effect's called self-explanation. Um, self it works really well for step-by-step -step logic problems. Um, other benefits of verbalization that are out there are peripheral awareness, so other people can hear what we're working on and help us with it. Um, if we're talking as we do stuff. Um, and we can understand peripheral awareness really easily because at any point in time, if we stop and look around us, the thing that we're focusing on um, will have the majority of our attention, but actually we're aware of all kinds of things, either from the corner of our eye or also uh, with our ears and, and other senses, we can do the same thing too. So, for example, what I saw in my research was when we had teams where people were pair programming, um, somebody might be working with their pair on something and then they'd overhear somebody working on something that they were interested in or maybe, maybe talking about something they were interested in and their ears would kind of prick up and they'd say, well, hang on a minute, no, did you just say so-and-so? Because that's not 
I don't think that's right, I don't think that was what was said, or I think that's something that I could help you with. So this peripheral awareness lets us kind of jump in and help each other and collaborate in that way. It also means that we can more fully involve novices, they can get immersed in the problem solving of more um, expert workers on the team as well. So it helps us with sharing knowledge, it helps us de-risking because we're not kind of so reliant on on a single expert. It helps us minimise bugs if we're pair programming and it helps us improve quality. So at this point I'm feeling really good about myself and like I found out all this stuff about verbaliz verbalisation. Verbalisation seems really good. It's all about the talking. That's good. I like talking. That works for me. Um, so I'm feeling really great. And then I come across this kind of stuff. So um, turns out that actually Talking isn't everything. In fact, in my study of 14,866 um, um, sentences of pair programmer dialogue, when I ran some of the statistical analysis on the dialogue, I found that expert or experienced pair programmers talk significantly less than novices. So that kind of burst my bubble, that it's all about the conversation, it's all about the talking. Some of the magic of collaboration is what happens in the spaces between the conversations, not necessarily in the talking itself. And this accords really nicely with um, early models of creativity as well that said, you know, creativity, you can do some preparation and some conversation in creativity, but then if you want to come up with a really creative solution, you need to move away and give your brain some time to incubate, to come up with ideas, to join things together in an unusual kind of way and through that creativity can emerge. Um, and again, I'm sure lots of us in this room have had a situation where we've been working on something, it's been really tricky, we're really kind of banging our head against the wall. We decide, do you know what? Actually, I'm going to have to call it a night. We go home, we have a sleep, we wake up, we get in the shower and go, oh, it's so, so simple. How did I not see the solution? And that's because our creative brain has had time to go away and work on it. Um, and there are even people using that idea in, um, in software development or, 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 or starting to. And my favourite of which is Ivan Moore, who claims that this is completely by mistake, just that he likes tea. But he created something that he calls tea-driven development when he was pair programming remotely. So um, what would happen is um, they'd, discuss the comp they'd discuss the problems a little bit and he'd go away and make a cup of tea. So while the kettle was boiling, He'd be on his own, quietly thinking about the problem space, letting his creativity, kind of giving himself a creative bubble for that to work. And so would his pair partner. Then after that, they'd drink the tea together and discuss how they were going to solve the problem, and only then would they start coding. So tea-driven development, I thought, was a great idea. But I guess what I'm trying to get at overall from that is that, turns out, knowing when to be quiet is an expert behaviour. Okay, so if we need loud and quiet when we're developing software, what other kind of diversity do we need? I've just got some diverse quotes about diversity from different people. So Frank Zappa. I love this. So this is quite recent. Prime Minister of Canada, this is around the, um, the um, immigration issues. Diversity fosters new ideas, and it isn't just sound social policy. Diversity is the engine of invention. It's pretty powerful stuff, I think. Okay, and my favourite researcher on diversity, this is diversity in general, I haven't got to neurodiversity yet, um, is Scott Page. So I saw Scott Page talk at one of the extreme programming conferences many years ago, I can't even think uh, uh, what, y what year it was. Um, Scott Page has created uh, and run, he's a lecturer in America, created and run lots of models around um, problem solving in teams. And Scott's favourite story, or certainly one that he tells a lot of conferences, is about the Netflix prize. So I don't know if you know about the next Netflix prize in 2006. Netflix wanted to improve their mechanism for, by which they make recommendations to people on films that they might like. 
So basically, they take all the information about how people have rated films that they liked, um, and then they kind of run some, run some algorithms and some, uh, some rule-based stuff on it, and then they come out the other end to, to recommend other movies that they might like. Okay. And Netflix kind of understand that this is an incredibly complex problem, and in 2006, they were struggling with it so much that they said, if anybody out there can improve their movie rating mechanism by more than 10%, they will give them a million dollars. Okay. So you can imagine, some, suddenly there are a lot of people quite interested in helping them solve this problem. Um, three, um, three very, very bright researchers got together and created a team called Belcor. That team managed to, over time, get the algorithm up to 6.8% better. So they didn't manage to get to the 10%, they got to 6.8%. Okay, and this is some three of like, the <coughs> brightest minds in, in mathematics at the time. Um, they can get it up past about 6.8. About so they combined their model with some other models, and they got up a little bit more. And then they combined with their biggest competitor, who was very different to them and they managed to get it up even more. And then what happened is the next three competitors underneath merged together. So these are people from very different international members, you know, really, really different. And they managed to get the same results as the top two guys. So the more we added they added diversity, the better results they got. And it ended up being kind of neck and neck between those two teams, both who managed to get it up to just a smidge more than 10%. So what Scott Page talks about is the fact that um, there are lots of stories like that where diversity has trumped ability. Um, and his models do the same. So he says, if I form two groups and one's random and therefore diverse and one's got the best individual performers in it, the random team almost always outperforms the high performers. Okay, so diversity nearly always trumps ability. And... If we're in the industry of thinking, then surely we want diversity of brains. We want all different kinds of thinkers. Um, and so there's this movement called the neurodiversity movement who have, who have kind of start, I like to think of them like pirates stealing the term neurodiversity. Um, and they've, and what they've, they've, they've taken that word to mean, do you know what, actually, you know diverse kind of neurological conditions that are out there, we don't really believe those are illnesses that need to be um, solved, we don't really believe that they're disorders, we believe that they're just a, a result of normal variations in the human genome, okay, and that we don't really need to, or we shouldn't be focusing on how to cure these things, we should be creating environments in which all kinds of brains can thrive and promote systems that let people live as they are rather than trying to make them conform to a pre-kind of defined uh, norm. So autism, oh, there you go, autism. Um, autism said to affect uh, one in 100 people. So in the UK alone, that's 695,000 people. So that's quite, quite a lot. Um, and as I say, when my son was diagnosed with autism, I started thinking about my own behaviours and, 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 and how I might be autistic. And I also thought back over my 25-year career in IT and thought about some of the amazing teams that I've worked on and some of the incredible people that I've worked with and actually how some of their behaviours kind of fit in quite well with autistic spectrum disorder as well. Um, and then I started looking at the research, and there's loads of research over, out there that supports it heaps. So my three favourites, Baron Cohn in 1998 found that autism occurs more in families with physicists and engineers and mathematicians. Um, Wyndham in 2009 found that the mothers of autistic kids are more likely to work in technology-related areas. Um, and I don't know how to pronounce this, Ruf Semmer, I think. Um, in 2011, found that when you compare IT-rich regions with non-IT-rich regions, then actually you get more autistic spectrum kids in, in, in IT-related regions. Okay, so there's a whole body of evidence out there that suggests that there's a link between autism and technology. And in fact, um, 
one of the most prevalent researchers um, and speakers on autism regularly goes to places like Google and eBay and Microsoft and talks about autism and says things like, if there wasn't any autism, you wouldn't have any new employees. Um, she also says, um, her name's Temple Grandin, by the way, she also says that if we'd never had, have autism, um, the human race would just be full of people who were still sat around chatting and, you know, no one had ever have invented tools or fire or any of those fine things as well. So why, 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 why IT and autism then? What makes those two things kind of fit together? So this is um, a very wonderful chap called Steve Silberman. This is from his um, TED talk. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote him directly because I think this is such a great quote. He says, by autistic standards, the neurotypical brain is easily distractible, is obsessively social, and suffers from a lack of attention to detail. Okay. Because the autistic brain is really good with special interests, with being incredibly immersed, with having a nearly encyclopedic knowledge of their specialist area of interest. And that seems to me like that's a really useful thing for us to have in, in the technology world. Um, and now we also find that places like um, SAP, Microsoft, um, are specifically going out there looking for autistic people to work for them because they realize that um, some of the things that make autists different are hugely desirable in IT. Um, so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story, I've got a bit of time. I'll tell you a story about me and IT and autism and how I think being a little bit on the spectrum helped me. So, um, once as a relatively junior programmer, I was working for a, um, a big software house and I was put onto a job at a large supermarket. And it's a large, it's a large international supermarket. Um, and what happened is that the European, I'm going to show my age now, the European working time directive rules had come in around how many hours people can work and what holidays they needed and all that kind of stuff, right? So I went in and I was like, okay, you're going to be on the working time directive team now, Sal. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, and they passed me this policy document and they said, this is the policy um, that we need to, obviously we've got all these, this, these people clocking in and out of the warehouses and supermarkets and everything. And we need to, we need to analyze that and make sure that nobody's working more than they should and everybody's taking the right holidays or that they've opted out of the working time directive, which turns out you can do that too. And I said, okay. And I went home with this big policy document that night and I came in the next morning and I'd memorized the whole thing. Um, and I sat down with one of the customers and we started talking and I was like, well, hang on because there's a contradiction between page six and page 17. And they were a bit gobsmacked. And from that point on, um, they nicknamed me Mustard because I was so keen. <laughs> so it definitely can be beneficial. Um, this is kind of the, the triad of impairment, so things that autistic people have difficulty with. Um, so at the top you've got language and communication, and that um, includes stuff like rabbiting on about your specialist subjects, just like I am right now, <laughs> um, uh, 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 and, and, and like irrelevant of whether it's an, the right kind of environment to do that in. Um, also, things like um, maybe not being so good at turn ta taking. Um, I definitely struggle with that on the phone, uh, particularly long distance. You know that little gap you sometimes used to get? Completely like froze, like who's going to speak now because I haven't got any cues. Um, so, so that can be an issue. So that's at the top. We've got social and emotional issues, particularly things like problems with unstructured parts of the day. Um, Collaboration can be difficult. Eye contact can be quite hard. Um, I listen my hardest when I stop looking at the person who's talking, and people often find that quite, quite difficult. So quite often, if I'm talking to somebody and they tell me something that's quite complex, I'll go, actually, can you just say that again? And then I'll look at the floor while they tell me so I can really, really focus on what they're saying. Um, so, um, so, so that can be the case. Eye contact can be um, sporadic. 
Also with um, unstructured things, so I might struggle with uh, parties and things like that where I'm not really quite sure when it's okay to start a conversation or leave a conversation with somebody um, without appearing rude. Um, so actually, if anything, understanding that I'm a little bit autistic has meant that I allow myself permission to just duck out of those things when I feel uncomfortable now. Um, Okay, flexibility of thought. Flexibility of thought means it's difficult to change routine. It means that um, lateral thinking can be quite hard, um, and it means that I might struggle with theory of mind. And theory of mind means understanding that other people may not know exactly the same stuff as I know, and other people may not react or feel about stuff exactly the same as I feel. Um, and there's a really quite famous and very old experiment around, around, um, around theory of mind that I like a lot because it's called the sally Ann test. Does anybody know about the sally Ann test? Yeah? So the sally Ann test, um, um, a child and a doll uh, playing. The child leaves the room and somebody hides the doll. Okay. The subject is then asked, where do you think the child is going to look for the doll when they come back into the room? Now, if you've got good theory of mind, so, so what do you think the answer is? So child's playing with the doll. Child leaves the doll. Let me make it a bit more tangible. Right? Child leaves the doll on the chair, leaves the room. While they're out of the room, somebody hides it under the bed. Where's the child going to look for the doll when they come back in the room? On the chair, right? Because you've got a good theory of mind, and you know that that child doesn't know what you know. Whereas people lacking in theory of mind would say the child will go in and look under the bed because everyone knows that's where the doll is. Okay? And that's a kind of extreme version of lack of theory of mind, but that shows you what theory of mind is. It's about us not necessarily being able to get into other people's heads. And I know that's something I struggled with maybe from a professional point of view because sometimes I don't write down or blog or talk about things that seem very obvious to me and then someone else does it and everyone's like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And I'm like, oh, I've just assumed everybody knew that. So, um, so, so lack of theory of mind. The other times when I've definitely had lack of theory of mind in, in my work is um, just assuming that I'm creating products that I'd love, that I'd want to use, that would be good for me, which isn't always who I'm developing for. OK, um, and the other thing on top of all of that is sensory processing disorders, which I know I've talked about quite a lot in my other talks, so I won't go into it in too much detail. But there's a tendency with people on the autistic spectrum to be over or under sensitive to any of the senses, right? So maybe noises might be really, really loud to me and hard for me to cope with. Or if I'm under sensitive to noise, you might have to talk to me really loud uh, before I um, clock that, some, that you're speaking to me. Um, I might be under or over sensitive to visuals, so like these lights are a bit ugh, crazy. Um, if I'm oversensitive, if I'm undersensitive, I might not notice. So I might, I do this all the time actually, I might push a door four times before I see the pull thing on it. Um, I can be over or undersensitive to smell, I can be over and sensitive to touch. Um, two other um, senses that people aren't necessarily always aware of are vestibular sense, which is my sense of balance can be miscalibrated and the um, proprioceptive center. So proprioceptive sense of proprioception is where understanding where my body is in space. Um, and the way that people usually show what proprioceptive, proprioception is, is if I can offer you all to um, put your right, right arm out, try not to bang the person next to you. Okay, now close your eyes, now touch your nose. So you knew where your nose was. Okay, so that's your proprioceptive system allowing you to locate your body in space, or not, um, if you're miscalibrated. Um, and so people, on, people with sensory processing disorders will need to re-stimulate their senses enough for them to be able to cope with the input that they're getting. So for example, if my sense of touch is miscalibrated, sometimes I might need to move or touch stuff to kind of wake it up a little bit so that I can tell actually that I'm typing loud and loudly, that I'm typing enough on the keys. And if I don't do that, I might be one of those keyboard clackers that, you know, because I'm just not getting enough feedback. Okay. 
Um, I'm actually slightly oversensitive to touch, which is why I struggled a lot with where, <laughs> with where the uh, microphone was being put on me, and I can feel it the whole time that I'm talking to you. Um, and that can happen too. So some people will not like not not be able to cope with certain types of material, not be able to sit on some types of chair. Um, and it's not necessarily through what I don't want to, it's actually that feels like uncomfortable because my sense of touch is so, um, because I'm just so sensitive. Um, and in terms of the proprioceptive system, so the nose touching where my body is in space, people with an under, under, um, underactive proprioceptive system need to move around a lot to re-establish where their bodies are in space. So you might see people spinning or moving um, or rocking on chairs, and that's just all about keeping the right level of stimulation for their proprioceptive system. Um, so autism and IT, I think we're almost getting to a stage now where people are like, yeah, yeah kind of everybody or lots of people know that there's a link. Um, one person in 100 in the UK, autistic, round about, okay. So um, three to 4% rather than 1% ADHD in the UK. Um, so I'm gonna, just going to kind of broaden out a little bit from autism. So what do we know about ADHD? It's hard to tune out diverse input from the environment, right? So, so the environment be, can be kind of screaming at us, and it's hard for us to filter, what's, filter, filter out, you know, and focus in. I'll give you a, a, an example. Well, actually, there's a great book called The Power of Neurodiversity that talks about the positive aspects of lots of, lots of different kinds of brains. Um, and in The Power of Neurodiversity, it says, when, an a, grade stu when, when, sorry, when a students are, le are learning the details of photosynthesis, ADHD kids are staring out of the window, wondering whether it still works on a rainy day. And that's exactly what I've seen. So my son's autistic and has ADHD as well. And I teach a voluntary coding club. And so one day I got into school a little bit early and they were teaching his group about greater than and less than. And he was like, kind of like rocking on his chair and looking out the window. And so I thought, what's going on there? It's quite interesting. So I, I didn't kind of do anything apart from watch. And I saw the teacher kind of going round student by student at the blackboard at the front saying, OK, so is seven less than or greater than four? Oh, well done. Is 15 greater than less than? And my son's rocking on his chair, looking out the window. And she says, Zach, you're not concentrating. And do you know what? I straight away think, do you know what? He got less than or greater than 10 minutes ago. And now he's looking over the, over the um, road at the house across the way trying to work out the percentage difference between the concrete around the bricks and the bricks themselves, right? And if maybe you take into consideration the top and bottom of the wall, is it still greater than or less than? Okay, and that's, and that's what attention deficit does. So the great thing about ADHD is it lets us pick up on peripheral details and do this kind of tangential thinking. And in fact, when I was preparing for this talk, I put a bit of a call out on Twitter uh, for people about like, how do you think your neurodiverse brain helps you within your tech career? Um, and a very eminent um, agile coach said, for sure, the skills that I've developed in living with ADD create coaching superpowers and intuition. Okay, so this is somebody that's, that's you know, very well known, really, really amazing coach, seeing the positive side of learning to live with ADHD. So that's autism, ADHD, bipolar disorder. I'm just going to have a drink. So I'm going to seem like I come from a really dysfunctional family now, but my mother had bipolar disorder my whole life, so I can kind of talk in quite a lot of detail about bipolar. Mm. So again, 2 to 3% of the population have bipolar disorder. Okay, so, so th possibly about three times more people than have autism. Um, so bipolar disorder, again, is, is a miscalibration, really, an extreme in our moods. So rather than, rather than everybody kind of fluctuating here between, I'm having a good day, I'm having a bad day, I'm having a really good day, I'm having a really bad day, these are people who fluctuate in moods um, in a very extreme way, and that these fluctuations can last days, weeks, months. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about depression separately, so I'll focus on the kind of hypermania side, the, 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 the elated end of the scale, of the scale. And people tend to be very extravagant they're in the, when, they're in, when they're in a hypermanic mode. They tend to have kind of a, a bit of a lack of concern for the usual social constraints that are around. So my mum, when she's having a bipolar uh, um, 
when she's in the bipolar phase, stays up all night, writes poetry because she feels like it, wears a particular colour from head to toe because for some reason she's feeling particularly tuned into something that day. Um, might do something called clanging, which is like verbal word association, where you just get these, this kind of stream of conscious word after word after word, right? And this is somebody that, that's just part of their mood swings, but it might go on for a month or so before their mood swings back again. Um, and I suppose famously, we've already had Stephen Fry spoken about this morning, haven't we, in the keynote? And I suppose famously, Steve, so Stephen Fry talks very publicly about his bipolar disorder. Um, Amazing things about hypomania. So much energy you wouldn't believe. So, and so creative. So again, when I was preparing this talk, I asked for, um, for people to tell me about, about any kind of um, neurodiversity that was that in tech. And again, a very eminent agile practitioner and coach is incredibly well known. Um, and I'm going to quote him, said, when I'm in the manic state, my mental filters are degraded, which means that I'm less judgmental and I can recognize patterns that I wouldn't otherwise identify. I understand the value of seemingly un unrelated ideas to solve problems that I'm struggling with. And rather than immediately trusting patterns as truth, I use them as potential ideas and test them out. Now that I'm practiced at spotting patterns, I no, need, no longer need to be in a manic state to do so. Okay, so... It's hypermania being awesome for you. Depression. That's my read of camper. Um, so, right, so if we think autism, 1%, okay, bipolar disorder and ADHD, 3%, nearly 20% of adults in the UK have, suffered from, have had, like, have experienced depression and not just kind of like I'm feeling a bit sad, actual depression. Again, from the power of neurodiversity, um, a study of a thousand eminent people from a wide range of different careers found 77% of artists, 54% of fiction writers, 50% of visual artists, and 46% of composers had had at least one significant depressive episode. So the reason that there's a car there, apart from that I'm kind of strangely in love with that car, um, is that, funnily enough, we think of depression as being something that's, that's a bit debilitating, that's a bit of an issue, but research shows that depressive people, clinically depressed people, have, have an unusually balanced view of things, okay? And the car driving thing is just one example. So, turns out, if you ask, a random sample of people, if they're a better than average driver, they nearly all say yes, right? Statistically, that's not possible, right? We can't all be in the top 50%. It just can't be true, right? So some researchers in psychology thought, that's quite interesting. Let's push it a little bit more and see how it works, right? So they went to a hospital, and they only asked people who've been in driving accidents, right? And guess what? Most people still thought they were in the top 50%. So they thought, we'll narrow it down even more. And they just asked people who not only had just been in quite severe driving accidents, but who had admitted that the driving accidents were their fault. And they still thought they were in the top 50%, right? And there's one group of people excluded from behaving like that, and that's people who are clinically depressed. They were superb at understanding their own abilities and, um, and, and gauging kind of the world around them in a way that people who aren't depressed are unable to do so. So maybe we should change depression for realism. Um, and again, I asked for quotes on, uh, on depression, and I got this quote again from a very eminent and, and, and brilliant agile coach who suffered from depression, who said, my depression has sharpened my empathy. It helps me every day in my job. I meet people where they are. I care and I connect to them really fast. I listen with my whole being, which enables me to hear what's being said, and I instinctively ask the right questions. See, depression being awesome. Okay, um, very quickly, we create environments in our job, and we create tools and techniques um, 
And we expect people to work in those environments using those tools and techniques and processes. And some of them are really helpful, and some of them are not so helpful. So I'll just give you a little taste for what I mean by that. Um, daily, daily scrums, daily stand-ups, same time, same place every way, every day. That's great if, I've, if I'm autistic, if, I'm if I struggle with changes in um, you know, the unknown and changes in routine and all that kind of stuff. Same three questions every day, brilliant. That really works for me. Um, using personas when I'm designing software. Again, great for theory of mind, but really make me realize that I'm not designing this for me, it's for somebody else. Keep that in mind by having the personas kind of plastered up in my workspace to help me think about that. Um, oh, I've done something slightly, slightly cheeky here. Hmm. Kanban boards. Here's a Kanban board. Here's a visual timetable for an autistic child. <laughs> so you can see that the structure of tan the tangible nature of what's going to happen next, or what I'm, am I working on the right things? Okay, it's there, right in my face, in a really, really tangible way that works for me. Meetings, or events, or ceremonies, or whatever you want to call them can be bewildering, so let's keep them structured with a clear purpose. Let's write down actions clearly and concisely so people go away understanding what it is they need to do next. And let's stop assuming that everybody wants to think on their feet. I love collaboration. I love when people come in the room and share their information. But I've started, as I've been looking into this stuff, I've started trying to provide a space for people who don't want to think on their feet, for people who aren't overly verbal, for people who struggle in social situations. How can I get their input into my retrospective or into my whatever it is and allow them the thinking space and time that they need because their input is just as valuable as anyone else's and it's the diversity of having them in my team that's going to make us a successful team. Also, keep meetings short. Okay, um, we also sometimes have working agreements, don't we? This is how we're going to work together as a team. Again, this is for an autistic child. At home, I can ask someone for help, tell someone how I'm feeling, be polite and respectful. I never scream, run away, have a tantrum, spit. Hopefully you don't need that when you're working, working agreements. Uh, <clears throat> but, so this is, this is exactly the kind of information that we need um, and that helps us understand. And I've even done, with, done stuff with people that I've been coaching who's, who, who've said stuff like, you know, I kind of feel like I'm talking a bit more than I maybe ought to be in, in things. Um, and, but I've got so much passion and so much to say that I don't know how to stop that. And we've done stuff like have physical tokens. And I've said, look, no one else needs to know this, but let's put three talking tokens in your pocket. And in the next meeting you go into, just for practice, we're going to practice talking three times, right? So think about, every time you think you're going to say something, think, do I want to use one of my three tokens on this? Just to help you start to filter when you want to talk and when you want to kind of save up. Um, and in fact, somebody was just telling me today that going to one of my talks last year helped them because they are now working with a team where there's one person who just commandeers, like when they're in a meeting, just commandeers everything, you know, and kind of like, talks over the top of everybody and interrupts everybody and all that kind of stuff. And that, you know, whilst the rest of the group are kind of just going, oh, yeah, well, no, that person's a real pain in the butt and it's really annoying behaviour, he's now able to think, well, do you know what? Maybe this person just has some challenges around turn-taking. And it doesn't mean that they're purposely going out of their way to be obstructive. So what can we put in place to help them? We also create these crazy, mad, and this is a, it's, I'm cheating a bit because this is a, a newsroom, but I've seen, definitely seen IT departments that don't look that different to this. Okay. These continually busy, noisy, open plan spaces with lots on the walls might not be the best option for everybody. Like, I love collaboration as much as the next person, trust me, but this might not be the best situation for everybody all of the time. So we need to offer people alternatives. We need to offer people 
a safe and forgiving environment that pays attention to people's varying needs without singling them out as being particularly different. And what I love about this isn't that it's kind of funky, it's that, you know what, you want to collaborate, you can do that over here, you want to be quiet, you can, you can, you can, you can kind of be in your own desks as well. Um, you want to have headphones on, you can. Um, so it's offering people those kind of opportunities to work in a way that's most helpful to them. It's understanding that saying, I'm just going to go and make myself a cup of tea, is easier than saying, I just need to move around a bit to re-establish my body's position in space. Um, it's understanding, um, or it's learning, actually, or it certainly was for me, to be OK with silence. And if you're not OK with silence, then do you know what? You can just fake it. So the wonderful Jean Tabaker, many, many years ago, um, taught me a superb trick because sometimes when I'm training or coaching, I'll ask a question and then I don't give people long enough to answer because I don't like silence very much. Okay? So what I do now is I ask the question and then I do this. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm not allowed to speak till 10. And usually someone else has got uncomfortable before me and they'll say something. Okay. One last slide. This is a quote. Um, again, from Steve Silverman's TED Talk, which is wonderful. I really recommend you go and, go and see it. This is a lady, an autistic lady, or an autist, called Zosha Zaks, who says, as we sell into an uncertain future, we need every form of human intelligence on the planet working together to tackle the challenges that we face today as a society. We can't afford to waste a brain. Thank you. Questions? I've only got five. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you know how they say that you should hire someone that fits into your culture, but at the same time, we want diversity and we want all of this. Uh, how do you think the two things that go together? I'm not even sure what culture I would love to create or to have a culture that embraced diversity and then you've solved the problem by the culture itself. If you've got a culture that's really accepting of diversity, then actually when you're when you're recruiting for the right culture, the right culture by its very nature is already there. And in fact, what it will do is, I guess, you'd, you, what, what, what it would do is stop you homogenizing too much, stop you, act, you know, inadvertently recruiting too much sameness. Um, when you say diversity, what do you really mean by it? people from different background, culture, or...? In this talk, mm -hmm. when I talk about neurodiversity, I mean different kinds of brains. So I mean the autistic brain, the ADHD brain, the depressed brain, the hyper... The, the bipolar brain, um, and specifically for this talk, in terms of what benefits a team in general, all kinds of diversity, cultural diversity, gender diversity, like age diversity, because that's another really, really interesting conversation within, you know, within, within the industry is, well, you know, why do we always want the young kind of straight out of college? Actually, you know, what about, what about employing older people who've got different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of experience and there's diversity in all of those things. So I think diversity just in general is a good thing. It's just my specialism is neurodiversity. Yeah. Talk about hiring. Um, things like awesome, as you said, have become quite, uh, people are quite culturally aware of. You talk about things like depression, which actually affects quite a larger proportion of people. How do you even bring that up in an interview, you know, that seems really difficult to address. It does seem really difficult, and I think, again, that is so, so true of the culture that we live in, right, is that these things are things we don't talk about, which is why when I first started talking, I remember the first time, um, it was at, at, at Agile Cambridge, um, in a little room that had kind of Andy Warhol pictures on the wall, and I stood up and said, my son's just got diagnosed with autism. I think I might be autistic. And I kind of like welled a little bit. And I thought, oh my god, this is really frightening. This is the first time I've done this. And I've been in the industry. And I speak about um, psychology and pair program and all these nice, tangible, safe things. Um, and yet now I'm, uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of opening up about 
about uh, neurodiversity. And I think we've just got to fight that fight. You know, we've just got to make it a safer place for it to be okay to talk about depression, for it to be okay to talk about whatever it is, knowing that actually some of those things mean that we need to work more carefully together, but at the same time, those are the same things that make people different. And if we're only recruiting people the same, it's not good for anybody. It's not good for our customers. It's not good for our product. It's not good for our organization. And we've all seen, I'm sure, organizations that have done that, have recruited you know, so many people that are so similar that actually they get really, really blinkered and you get this kind of shift where now they're not creating the right product for the world anymore because they're just creating and, 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 and they get very extreme in their views. So I don't have an answer apart from we all just need to work on it. But <laughs> Sorry. Is, is that going to be one of the things that you can differentiate? I mean, on a 20% of people having depression, if you've got nine people in the team, you're likely to have at least one, maybe two people in there statistically. Yeah, so yeah. It's not something that is... Right, so I'm not sure that you could actively, what's it called, actively, discriminate. positively discriminate. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure you could do positive, positively discriminate and say, oh, I want, I, you know, that's what I'm looking for on people's CVs. But, um, but I think, you, I think what you can do is not discount people because they say, I, I, you know, I've got depression or I've got, I've got ADHD or whatever it is and provide an environment that's supportive and, and you know, to their needs, whatever they might be. Yes. Just thinking about somewhere I worked with, one of the chaps I worked with, um, on the spectrum, and it's one of those things where it's not something that HR can kind of share with everyone, or that individual chose to share with everyone, but clearly there was something special about him in, a, in an awesome way. Mm. And basically, I found him very easy to work with because being a coach, you, you care to listen to how the person speaks and how they interact with you and, and everyone else. Um, whereas with some of the teams that he was in, he chose to think he was awkward and very stuck in his ways. And it was one of those things where in the sense I hate to say it, but you know, people go, what was wrong with it? Nothing was wrong with him. It's just they didn't understand how to interact with him. But there was this whole HR kind of policy where you can't disclose facts. And sometimes you sort of think, do you know what, people just knew that he had a problem and that if you walk past him in the street, he doesn't recognize your face because mm. it's a very contextual thing for him to see you work. He then knows who you are. He's not being rude. He just can't help it. That you change the way that you interact. Yeah. And actually, rather than seeing this as awkward guy, if you sort of go, okay, yeah, you can come across as awkward, but he's brilliant. <laughs> Listen to what he's saying rather than how he's saying it. Um, you know, we've learned something, but it, there still seems a stigma, which I think is kind of permeated from HR, where it's just like this blanket thing, you can't talk about it, when there's clearly something happening for one person, and there's not a lot you can do. I don't know if you find this as well. So so a couple of things. One is, I think, I think people in HR sometimes are just stuck. They just don't know what to do about. They're like, well, yeah, this person's like, you know, their team don't know what to do, how to interact with them. They think they're difficult when they're not being difficult. And so, so I think HR having some of the tools that can help to set, to, to, without saying, oh, everyone needs to know you're on the autistic spectrum. Like, have you thought about having a visual timetable for your day? Have you thought about using, I don't know, a wobble cushion or whatever for, or noise cancelling headphones or whatever it is that here's a bunch of stuff that I know can help. Um, there are emerging, um, but only a couple, only in America that I know are so far, specific organisations that do that kind of consultancy that help companies to um, provide the right kinds of things for those people. Um, so it's stop time, but um, I'll talk to you about it after. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because they're experienced at that point, right? so they'll be fine. Um, so just one very quick um, happy story and one sad story. So sad story is I do get people ringing me up sometimes saying we don't know what to do so we're going uh, uh, so um, we think we're just going to have to get rid of this person. I've had someone on on one of my courses say that actually someone on their team was sacked because um, that you know they couldn't get along with the rest of the team and it really was that 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 person sounded like they were autistic but they just didn't know how to interact with them. Um, to a really good story from a friend of mine who works in the States who's got somebody who who has got undiagnosed, we think, Asperger's um, on this team, or certainly he doesn't know from HR otherwise. Um, 
and was obsessed with coding standards. So he used to really annoy everybody because he'd be like, oh, hang on, it doesn't conform. And all he did was move him into a more of a kind of like training the juniors in the coding standards position. So now it's brilliant. He gets to talk about his specialist subject all day long. He gets to police it. They do bits of, bits of, bits of stuff. They send it to him to see whether it complies and he kind of teaches them the coding standards. And it just works. So sometimes it's about finding the right position for someone to thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, you're all good.